I am a designer at Shell Games in Pittsburgh. Now, some of you, but not all of you, um, uh, I'll be leading the discussion. In this sense, I'll be guiding us from topic to topic, but I'm going to try to stay as little as possible about the topics and let you guys have conversation with yourselves. You are at the Design to Educate Roundtable, and this is sort of a prompt for what the kinds of topics we might discuss. So dealing with practical realities of integrating education, experience design, working with subject matter experts, applying learning theory, validating the learning that's taking place, and working in different environments like formal versus informal. So those are some topical prompts. The way that we're gonna uh, run this round table, first we're gonna together brainstorm a few uh, questions. So I give the topics we might want to cover. And I'll type them up here so that we can all see them. And then we'll just start, we'll pick some of the ones to start with and go through each one. Um, we have about 50 minutes. I'm going to try to keep each conversation to around five minutes. If it's really interesting or we want an interesting tangent, we might let it go longer. It's okay if it goes shorter. But I just want to keep us moving so we can cover a number of topics. Uh, and the way that I'd like people to indicate they want to speak, you can just raise your hand and I will gesture to you. I will not probably not use your name because I'm not going to remember all your names. Uh, and then you can just speak. And in terms of what you share, you can use as much time as you need and as little time as necessary so that everybody has a chance to share and we can uh, hear a lot of different points of view. Okay, so why don't we get started? Um, anyone have a topic? I'd love to hear. Actually, before we, before we do that, uh, we don't have, I think we have too many people for everyone to go around and introduce themselves. But, a show of hands, who here is a developer working on building experiences on the technology side of it? Okay? And who here is a subject matter expert or researcher or a few, a few ed, um, educator, teacher? Okay, and other organization or company? Alright, so we have a really good mix of perspectives. Great, right, it's kind of cool. uh, Okay, so, any ideas? Raise your hand if you have an idea for a topic you'd love to see this room talk about. I'd love to hear ideas on validating impact in informal learning environments. Great, anyone else? I've transferred learning from games to real life experiences. Other ideas? Um, story structure <laughs> in location-based informal set environments. Okay. Is that right? <laughs> Success in a game is evidence of learning. Any questions related to working with experts crossing disciplinary boundaries? I thought they were kind of um, people's war stories in that regard. So I think that was interesting to learn from that. Understand uh, people's biases um, or genders um, that are for evident in the game. Can you say that one more time? Sorry. Um, let me see. Um, an exposure of either the game maker's bias and other uh, genders or the player's bias or gender. I mean, I just came from peacemakers and so um, understanding what the agenda is. Yeah. Okay. Maybe let's get, try to get maybe two more. Yes. <clears throat> um, on a more global scale, um, I'm concerned with the 
the role of design as a, a fundamental component of education um, in terms of the, what I see in promoting STEM. The uh, design has been left out um, once in a while. You hear STEAM and there's art implied, but design is, would be, uh, in most people's minds, you can't even differentiate art and design. Um, I think um, we need to look at how, how um, design fits in in the global scale as part of um, one of the fundamental aspects of thinking. Great. And one more, any last? Well, we can get started with these. And we'll go, this is, I think this is a small enough, but we can kind of run through them in the order. Um, and we'll see where that leads us. So, validating impact in informal learning environments. Does anyone have anything to share about an experience maybe working or struggling with this challenge? So, um, so I'm a product designer at Duolingo. Uh, we are a free language education software platform. Um, okay. um, one thing, thank you for introducing where you're from. Can you also, when you speak for the first time, if you could also share your name sure. and your uh, role there. I'm Sean, and uh, I'm the product designer there. Um, now, our product really was intended for exactly the formal language environment. Uh, we never thought Duolingo would be used in a classroom or in a formal tutoring relationship, so it really was thinking about a scalable way we could educate users wherever they are. And to that end, it, we made it as uh, gamified as possible, um, intending for students to learn on you know, mobile phones and laptops, really any device with internet connection. Um, as for validating impact, I think certainly that was a struggle. Um, we started off not really knowing what the best practices were or how we can measure success. Um, so initially, one was really traffic. So how many downloads are we getting? How many visits are we getting? And as that number grows, um, we can start using our pool of users to get statistically significant data. Of um, so now we have all kinds of metrics baked into our product from uh, user retention. If someone comes to our service today, how likely will they come back tomorrow, two days later, three days later, and so on? Um, so I would say that's probably the biggest metric we're trying to design for, um, encourage people to come back. Because learning a language is a really complicated and boring thing, so it's common for people to drop off pretty quickly. So if we could you know, fine tune that number, we know we're doing a better job. Um, now, as we've grown, we've also hired some really talented uh, machine learning experts, so um, we're able to uh, make our learning experiences better and unique to each user. Um, so, validating impact, I would say, is one, are people coming back more often? And are we uh, teaching more groups? Um, are they retaining the knowledge longer? Um, and again, all of this is baked into our so I think, um, especially if you're starting out, just coming in to uh, embrace the data-first, data-driven uh, design model where, you know, whatever design decision we make, can we get meaningful data out of this and um, always keep that in mind. Does anyone have any uh, related stories, maybe a, a different product or a different um, uh, area in which you're trying to get similar types of metrics? My name is Krishna, I'm from the Robotics Academy at CMU. Basically uh, what we do is we have curriculum for real physical robots and curriculum for virtual robots and games for virtual robots. I think the biggest thing we learned from using virtual robots in the informal system is that uh, kids learn 40 days faster than kids that use real robots. So a kid trying to learn robotics curriculum with a real robot takes 100 days, whereas with us, with our virtual games, they take only 60 days. And we have a research paper out on it. So, you know, doing something different and having a virtual world and a virtual robot for every student helps make something you know, much more faster. And, you know, we've had a lot more success with virtual robots than real robots off late. So How do you do your validation? Well, mostly we have uh, a badge system and a lot of it 
depends upon that. So we've given out about 250,000 badges and kids come back more for the badges. And with real robots, there is no badges. So, you know, we kind of go that route. I just have a question about the, the badges piece. What, what does one have to do to earn a badge? Well, there are different uh, robotics challenges. So it starts off from a super simple moving forward command, which you know is just a skill that you learn. But then from there on, you solve mazes, labyrinth challenges. And each one of them gives you different badges. Some are for programming, and some are for you know, just for fun, so that they're more motivated. Where, um, the title of your research or where it came from? Uh, the Robotics Academy at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Okay, has anyone used any, um, or any different uh, validation methods, especially for an informal environment where you may not have it in the room, or you may not have, it may not be um, being guided through the experience? Can you just introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Ailey Liberati. I teach three, four, five, and six-year-olds at Pittsburgh Montessori. Um, we use Compass Learning, um, which is a program that uh, children can go at their own rate, and I can tell that I can um, see how many of them do it at home, plus how much time they're on, and definitely the more time that they're on, the improvement in their skills and how they target certain things. And also, the Pittsburgh Public School just bought RAS Kids, which um, gives out badges. And um, may I talk all day long about the setting in a book, and then all of a sudden, not, well, what is the setting now that they're earning a badge? So. All right, we're going to move on to the next uh, question. So, transfer of the learning from the game to real life. Anyone have a story or? or a second question about this. I have a question. Todd Hoffman from the Environmental Charter School. I'm the director of technology there. And this is one of the biggest things that prevents me from wanting to implement sort of full scale, whatever we want to call it, uh, gaming in, in the classroom, uh, is this transfer of learning. I have, for example, I have students uh, using um, Minecraft. Uh, in, in a few classrooms, and I'm trying to extract from the students what it is they're getting out of it. So trying to get them to reflect on that process. And so far, they're not able to articulate what it is they're getting out of it, aside from it's, it's a cool experience. Um, so I'm not seeing that transfer of learning. It could be to do with the way in which it's set up, I don't know. Um, but I'm really curious if people have some insight here. Um, as to how you can sort of measure that or how you can encourage that transfer of learning. Just a quick follow-up question. How are they how are they demonstrating what they've learned? Like what, what's that task? Are they doing this in like an interview or Yeah, just an informal interview. And do they do they do that in other areas too? Like mm -hmm. they do that in metacognition process yeah. for others? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah so Eric Parks a PhD student currently <coughs> in computer interaction. Um, and I think well Sort of a pushback on that, I would say, is, is uh, well, I think you were sort of answering it in this question, but another question I would sort of ask is what are they doing in Minecraft? Particularly if they're using it in school, if they're doing it at home, whatever they're getting it at home. But I think in a completely unguided experience, you're not going to see transfer because you're only going to notice transfer when you're measuring some sort of target skill. And if you're not targeting them at a skill, mm -hmm. then they're probably not going to get there. Um, and so I think. And I mean, that's not necessarily to say that open-endedness is bad. It's that open-endedness can be well-crafted towards a goal. And I think if it's completely ungoal-driven, which I think Minecraft is in its sort of default state, then it'll be hard to sort of figure out what exactly they're getting out of it. Uh, Sarah Chambucci, Arts Education Collaborative, uh, here in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm just sitting here thinking, is it having to do with the game, or is it having to do with their ability to transfer any of their learning? into real world. Is it about gaming or is it about their ability, the skill that it takes to transfer to learn? Learning something in a class, or learning content. Can I take that and see where I apply it for the rest of my life? Forget the gaming piece for a minute. Because if they're not doing it with other content, this is a foreign thing, which has two layers. It's how do I transfer those skills into the real world, and then what about what am I learning in the gaming process to transfer? 
Gabrielle Swing, Abbey North High School, um, graphic arts educator. I think too at that age level, if they're not being guided in what they're supposed to transfer out of it, they're not going to be able to articulate that either. Um, if there's no goals in the gaming process, then they're just open-ended playing and they're not going to be able to talk about the metacognition. I'm just going to say as a tip for developers who provide teachers with rubrics would be a helpful thing. Um, can, I, can I just ask a follow-up for that a little bit? Can you talk a little bit about the type of rubric you might look for? Well, I mean, so people have to know what their expectations are. So if a child's going to do something in Minecraft that, you know, how much, um, were you able to use only these many blocks and do it so that each score that you could just be able to, um, it has to be measurable. How are we measuring what we're asking of the students? So, so a rubric provides what, what the evaluator is looking for. So one, two, so the, the games do have an evaluation. Like in Compass Learning, they are evaluated. There is, um, and I demand that they have 80% on the tasks that they do, so then they have to redo it. Um, so I think that sometimes it definitely it would be a big selling point is that the teacher doesn't have to create the rubric that is already somehow in the yeah, um, I'm Brooke Morrill, I'm the Educational Researcher at Shell Games. Um, we recently uh, developed a partnership with a website called Glass Lab Games. I don't know, the, some nodding, but some not. Glass Lab is a, it's a, col a collection of games that have been specifically developed to meet certain standards, curricular standards. So um, we did one for systems thinking that kind of tied into middle school engineering design. Uh, there's one that specifically teaches children how to uh, graph on a coordinate plane, and there are you know teacher guides and all sorts of things that will essentially tell you what the student is going to learn if they progress through different levels of the game. So that seems to be a nice direction to go in a different resource to seek out. That's a good are there are there opportunities for reflection built into the game at all to sort of measure that that growth? Um, there, it depends on who developed the game. All the games are developed by different uh, firms, but the games do generate different types of reports for the teachers. So they're specifically called shout out, watch out reports. So students are doing really well in X, Y, and Z, or these students are having a difficult time in A, B, C. That so that's at least something that the teachers can get from the students' performance in the game. Okay, we're going to move on to the story structure, and I think, can you talk a little bit, or you're sorry, can you talk a little bit more about um, what you were Absolutely. getting at there? Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Burke. I do uh, video production at Disney. Um, so what I was curious about is, basically I'm thinking about um, museums in particular, uh, but I'd love to hear examples outside of that. Um, and I work at the California Science Center also, um, and we have a ton of different informal learning opportunities, but everything is really disjointed. And I think science museums sort of have this problem universally where there are great experiences to interact with some display or something like that, but once you've, you end that transaction after you leave that area and there's no real narrative flowing through. And I was curious to see just if anyone has experienced anything either in a museum setting or some other out of the classroom setting where there's been a really powerful or coherent story um, that sort of links all these different learning opportunities together or if you've seen an experience that actually has a goal at the end. Um, it doesn't have a super coherent story, but uh, Cleveland Art Museum has uh, the space called Gallery One uh, that was developed, and it it has a number of interactive experiences that are all kind of connected to you exploring the heart in different ways, like how it's made and how it relates to your life, and then um, and then connecting you to the art in the museum, so helping you find the things that you connect with. So it's really it's a, the the storyline is kind of exploration based, but all all of those pieces kind of connect together. Um, how are they exploring those pieces? Is it through videos or? Uh, lots of interactive stuff. So like they you they teach you different painting styles, so you can actually like 
use touch screens to pull different like paints. There's videos so you can learn about how gold leaf's made or how um, different different art through the ages is made and you choose different stuff. So there's there's a lot of depth to it. Um, Local Projects was the designer for it. Anybody else in the developers in there have anyone worked on a, a project where you have these distinct learning moments but you have a thread running through it? Yeah, uh, John Baylash, uh, a graduate of the ETC and a professor and soon to be a student again. Um, we're working with the Great Lakes Science Center up in Ohio, near, well, in Cleveland. And uh, my class is developing um, uh, a project with the Oculus, but we're going through the idea that we're working with uh, what they call the Great Science Academy, which is their students. And so what we're, since we're not fully fledged, we're not an ETC or anything like that, um, we're actually looking at the design process. And so through working with the, their students and the, um, the center itself, we've, we've sort of put in Easter eggs that they see. If anyone goes in the, in the science center, they can see the science academy. They can see the stuff that they're working on. And we've put that into the virtual environment which is also reflective of just the environment we're working on a project about, like Geary. Uh, and so it's sort of, not really, but it sort of blends and bleeds through all those different areas. Uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely, <clears throat> it's been a really good experience, um, by no means polished, but uh, definitely an interesting uh, exploration of, of something on the brink of that. Now, I'm Mike Crystal. I'm a professor here at the ETC. I've been in museums where you're given an RFID card when you come in, and you make choices at different exhibits, and those choices go with you to help influence the story you get at future exhibits. So you're getting a personalized story based on the choices you're making at stations within the display area. And it just builds up and makes it very personal. It makes it much more interesting. Yeah, just on for RFID. What's, uh, is there any particular example? So I'll give you two, they're pretty diverse. One is a museum in Sydney, Australia, which is a maritime history museum. The other is the, the John Paul II uh, Pope Cultural Museum, which is next to the Catholic Shrine in Washington, D.C. So that one is not teaching, it, it's more, it is teaching, it's teaching a different thing. Does anyone else have a to share about that or any follow-up question? All right, success in the game as evidence of learning. Um, so, paragraph said again, Carnegie Mellon. Um, so, I, I think a lot about this kind of question in my research, and one of the interesting things that I find about it is that success in a game doesn't necessarily and commonly doesn't correlate with learning, um, depending on how the game is structured, and it's sort of a debate as to whether or not that's useful. But um, there's sort of if your goal is that someone learns that certain things are good and other things are bad, they actually need to experience that failure to understand the dichotomy of a concept. And so, if they're only succeeding, they're not necessarily guaranteed to be learning their content. Um, and we have various ways that we've worked on analyzing that that are probably too in depth to talk about right now. But um, yeah, that's just sort of an issue I wanted to bring up at least. Has anyone seen that in the work that they've done, or maybe a tool you've used in the classroom or for your own research? Well, Scott Stevens, I'm also a professor at the ETC. <clears throat> Eric has studied some games that some of our students, Mike and I, uh, have developed, so we have different opinions on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the, one of the um, games actually several in the same space is on uh, balancing and that's uh, can be a very complex task if you get to complex problems and uh, these games were designed for K through third grade students um, 
as an aside, I mean, the typical kinds of experiments, I think, or evaluations that are done tend to be let's do pre and post tests and let's do statistics on it. And uh, there's at least one journal that is no longer accepting, and it's in the area of uh, psychology, no longer accepting p values in statistics because they're not always very good. Uh, and my personal feeling is, and you can structure the game such that if they, and I agree, failure is important. If though a student ultimately at the end is able to solve the problems within the game, I don't understand why you need a formal pre and post test to convince anybody. All you want to do is see if they're successful in that. Now, transfer is another thing, but I don't know that we see transfer, you know, being able to be evaluated very well in anything. Do you know if your students come out? And get, can they change and register? I don't know. So, um, uh, transfer is very important. I don't think we measure it well in anything, much less games. Oh, I just wanted to. My name's Eric Kaler. I'm a long list of the program here at the ETC, and um, I guess I'm a consultant now. <laughs> but um, for people interested in, in this uh, issue of collecting evidence, there is a framework called evidence-centered design that is worth looking at for people like Bausch, Robert Misluggan. In fact, there's a gigantic book that just came out. I think it's called Bayesian Assessment in Education by Robert Misluggan, who is one of the masters, I think, this, one of the creators of this technique. And it's basically using a form of Bayesian statistics to go after these issues. How do you, how do you collect um, evidence of success at some learning task using uh, using what people are actually doing, rather than trying to get away from some of these uh, the traditional pre-test, post-test, that, that sort of thing. So, if this is an issue that is of importance to you, I'm guessing it probably is. Uh, check out evidence-centered design. If you Google it, all sorts of stuff will come up. Robert Mislevy, um what's his name? Uh, Russell Almond, Valerie Shute at Florida, Almond and Valerie Shute are at Florida State University, and, and if you are intrepid and can deal with a gigantic like 700 page book, it's actually not too bad. But um, <laughs> I haven't really, I, I just got it a few days ago, but it's, it's more accessible, I think, than people would realize. But um, it's definitely worth checking out because that's one of the things that. That, you know, like um, the people at the MacArthur Foundation throw a lot of resources that people are using these techniques and that sort of thing. Eric used Bayesian analysis in his PhD dissertation on a physics game that he developed, uh, and is one of the few, if only, at least currently, that I know in this space that's used Bayesian analysis as an interesting approach. Yeah, you're better at not this. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you your key values with nothing. Did anyone else what I, I also wanna like maybe play a little bit with the devil's advocate here and steer this conversation off but did you I, I just wanted to throw in one more element of first of all, there's a shorter journal article called Evidence Centered Game Design. Um Miss Levy's also on it. Uh, I'll show up by Google Scholar. Um, but uh, another technique that we use, which I have paper draft, I should probably send you, um, is looking at um, the, the sort of error rate of, of, of individual skills rather than overall games on the assumption that error rate goes down as you have opportunities to practice. And so even though a player might not be doing very good at the game, you can actually see that they may be learning a couple of particular skills and maybe the window of observation you had on them was too short to actually see if they were going to win the game or not. But you can actually tell if they're getting better at certain skills over others. Um. And that's actually the, one of the directions I wanted to kind of take this down. That kind of, sometimes I hear people talk about two different things. Like, the end of the game, did they succeed? Did they get the badge? Did they complete the level? Did they finish? And that, in and of itself, makes evidence. I don't know, as a game designer, I've definitely seen players brute force their way. Um, and then there's like, what are they doing? It doesn't matter with, if they get to the end, but how many mistakes they make along the way, that kind of thing. So I'm curious if anyone else, maybe over on this side of the table in particular, where we haven't had so many voices, maybe has something to share about that? Or? Um, 
some of my findings, and uh, so Warren Wake, uh, consultant, and I've taught at Carnegie Mellon in the past. Um, it's, a lot of what I find interesting in, in gameplay and learning is um, not the success, but the failures. And some people are really methodical about the failures intentionally. Uh, for instance, they're going through a first-person shooter. They want to find all the traps. And each time you discover a trap, you're killed, so you've lost. It lost at least that, that round. Um, and sometimes that will be evidence of greater learning, that the more failures that they've encountered. There are a lot of um, theorists in education who say it's really about the failures, it's not about the successes. So that would really turn the, the question on the side there. For the educators in the room, how does that jive with you? I mean, thinking about like how many times did they fail, meaning being the important number versus the one that the first time they succeed being important. It could also be a question of if you if you just fail and give up, or if you fail and keep on trying and really mm -hmm. learn from that. Yeah. I think uh, John Boylan, the principal at Burrell High School in uh, Westmoreland County. I think one of the things we run into with that with, with failure is the repercussions of the failure in the grade, and students are grade driven, not uh, experiential driven, as you're, as you're talking about, where that learning takes place through failure. And that's something that we're trying to, that's a cultural shift though, that's something that's very difficult to teach not only the kids, but the parents more so probably. So. Anyone else want to add anything to um, Mark Hubert, I'm an administrator at Shark Tears Valley School District, and I think, kind of to the question, it's rel relative, or relative for both, whether how many times they get it wrong and how quickly they get it right. But I think focusing on getting it wrong, especially in the educational games, I see a wide range of this is wrong, here's the correct answer, or this is wrong, this is why the other answer is correct, and that reasoning helps teach them why they get it. Um, if you just keep saying it's wrong, here's the correct answer, the kids aren't going to learn from it, and therefore the data is going to be skewed about how long it takes them to get it right. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges in some educational software that we have is just that ability to know how is the kid there for this? Because unfortunately from the teacher perspective, you're not going to know that the kid, if you're doing this for a homework assignment or an activity, you're not going to get that data right away to say, hey, this kid's struggling. It's going to take you a day, or if it's a week-long assignment, a couple days to figure out what's going on. And by that time, the kids miss so many that they have that skill embedded in their head the way that they were doing it. It's very hard to break that. So I think we need to find a happy medium between that. Um, as an educator at the high school level, Gabriel again from Avonlore. I, I find students who are going from being the gamer to trying to learn to code is where um, I have issues with um, they'll reach the failure and then they don't want to persist. They don't want to keep going through, which kind of comes back to where is design educationally and the paradigm shift that needs to happen between there isn't just one right answer, there are many right answers. and the large evolution that probably needs to take place in education in general. Matt Connor, Administrator of Rural School District as well. The only thing I was going to add to this conversation, and I love what you're saying, is as an educator, but also as a parent, I, I look at children and, and how they deal with failure, and they need to have that little bit of success to build confidence, but at the same time, they need to be able to handle so finding that balance is such a struggle, mm -hmm. and, and obviously in the real world too. So I, I, I don't know, I struggle with that as a parent as well. Yeah. And I think too, as an educator, um, as a teacher, teachers don't like to make mistakes either. So I think, um, I think that the culture actually, that the culture of mistakes are the best way to learn, really needs to, um, come into like the professional development realm of education because as educators, as adult educators, as teachers, um, as administrators, whatever, we have to celebrate the struggle. And we don't because we're in such a time crunch to teach to the test. And I hate to, I'm saying it, it is the truth, but there are a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of, educa a lot of educators who don't, who, who know the better way but the system that we're in right now is, um, there's just a lot of conflict in terms of kind of creating that balance. So. Gabriela Ross, I'm a science coordinator at the uh, Allegheny Intermediate Team, and I just want to just second all those comments about 
um, the productive struggle and that we need to embrace that growth mindset for the students, for the educators in professional development, but also for the parents. And in earlier sessions there was often mentioned that necessity to also include parents and reach out to them. And so everybody needs to be on board so that we can all support that mindset and the gaming community as well. Is everybody familiar with growth mindset? Um, I'd just add another stakeholder group to that list that Jillian made, and that would be pre-service teaching, mm -hmm. how, we're, how we're training the teachers coming in, not just remedying the problem of the people who are in the field, which is a whole other issue, but what's coming down the pipeline. And they're, they're coming up with the idea, I am now a teacher, and my red marking pen that tells you you are wrong is my job. Not that you learn, but to tell you when you're wrong. When you're wrong, but to remediate what the issue is, right? And that's not what's being taught. So let me uh, flip it to the developers in the room. When you think about designing for failure in, the, in whatever you're designing, what are the kinds of, how do you deal with that, getting at this issue of how we deal with failure in schools, but thinking about for our experience design? Does anyone have an example, maybe? So, I mean, actually, in our games, we never say you fail. You know, that's, that's probably the first thing that throws them off. And then every time they get a wrong answer, they're actually taken back to the original problem and it's broken down into much simpler you know, answers. And then they're asked the same question again and at that point they get it. And you know, we don't fail them in any case where if they take five turns, they still succeed. And you know, the top 10% of the class by then is on the ninth question. And we, we really don't care about uh, you know, we, we don't want to discriminate between the top 10% and the bottom 10%. And so we break down the problems into much simpler answers so that they pick it up much easier. Any others? Uh, yes, it's a similar way. We, so Duolingo's uh, mechanic used to be, we have, each lesson is 20 questions um, and you have three hearts. If you lose all three hearts, you lose that lesson and you have to start again. Um, and that, that was core in our product for two years. Um, and we recently went to this model where it's impossible to lose. There are no hearts. Um, and we were able to do this because we um, start to make the lessons adaptive. So if we can tell that you're getting all these questions right, your lessons are shorter. And if you get things wrong, your lesson just becomes longer. Um, and what we've noticed was retention is way higher. People are no longer discouraged. If someone loses a lesson, they are 300% times more likely to never come back than if they succeed. So just by making that little change, we know that people are coming back way more. Um, as for learning value, they're still learning. Um, with these adaptive lessons, we're also able to figure out when the next best time to, give the, to display this word to the student. Because we know if we are pounding you with the same word, uh, muher, 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 you might know that word for like the next day, but if we ask you three weeks later, you might forget. So we're even fine-tuning that model. All right, when's the next time we can show you the word repair? At that crux position where you might forget it or you might get it. And then if you get it right, we know you know that word. Um, um, I just want to respond about the failure thing. Uh, I'm sorry, Zach. Um, I, we, I, uh, just came to Pittsburgh recently and previous to this I was doing a hands-on science and engineering education in New York uh, after school and um, in sort of uh, trying to communicate the engineering spirit we would like tell our kids all the time like we want you to fail like a lot like if you're not like something is terribly wrong here like you should yeah. fail all the, try to build the thing failure learn from it but we are really trying to um, enforce a uh, positive sense of failure rather than a negative sense of failure to make the word not be like a boogeyman. Not merely the word, but the idea not be a boogeyman. Right. This is a continuation. What, what we do in our games is also, the first time you get it wrong, we give you a hint for the answer. The second time we give you another, another hint. And the third time you get it wrong, we take you into a textbook kind of uh, mode where you actually learn more about the concept that you're trying to, you know, answer. That's great. So and then you go back once you get everything right in the textbook, kind of 
uh, level, you go back to where you were and you continue. So, yeah. There's one in the back with that. Hi, uh, Matthew Brokoff, um, Instructional Enhancement at UCLA Extension. Uh, we're talking a lot about failure modes, but um, I think there is a tendency to just assume that a success state means complete success. So when you win, it's assumed that you've learned, and there's often a lack of feedback after success to ensure that the student understands the lesson rather than just completed it mechanically. So the reflection of reflection? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just a quick uh, comment on that. Yeah, but something we, we noticed immediately, especially with language learning, is you, you could feel like, you know, I learned the word mujer means woman, I know it today, but we also recognize there's a decay of that knowledge. Um, and to bring that to the, the UI, the interaction is, you know, when you've learned a skill, you've earned that gold badge, um, but if days go by where you're not um, re revalidating that knowledge, you're not you know, answering the word move hair the right way. Um, you take away the gold badge, and visually, you, you kind of have the desire to keep your whole experience shiny and gold. But um, that little subtle uh, change uh, was pretty successful for us. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the next topic. So, war stories from collaborating cross disciplines. Have a story to share working with someone outside of your domain. I, I can speak from like a K 12 perspective, really, just that our disciplines tend to live in silos. And, um, and the t I think our challenge is that the time it takes to create an interdisciplinary experience um, is. That's the challenge, is finding the time to have, get people at the table, just like this, to work together to make that happen. Uh, I, I think most educators love that idea. I think we would love to be like that. And I think some schools are set up for integration, um, but as you go through the system and you're in high school, and it's, it's more difficult to integrate, um, not to say that it's not important. I think the project-based learning is getting to that, um, but again, it's, it's that struggle for time to to think. What about the developers in the room? I'm not a developer, but I, I <clears throat> my name's Anna. I ran a community called Working Examples for a very long time, which was all about getting people to share how they did their work rather than what they did uh, in education. And so I was always amazed at how often people had not talked to people like outside of the space that they were working in, whether that was a researcher talking to a game developer or to an educator. Um, and I just think being, I know it's really challenging to make all those things happen, but watching the conversations that came about on our site as a result of that was such an amazing thing. And so being, like when we, we designed our site, we were very intentional about bringing other people into that process. And I think being, being intentional in the way that you design your work, whether that's a game or a curriculum or whatever, and bringing people to the table and figuring out what language you need to have to communicate with each other and all of that is just such a worthwhile endeavor. That's my soapbox. Excellent. Um, I led a uh, game development course at Penn State um, with a, a dual population in the class, of half uh, information sciences, computer science, and uh, half arts students, um, something like the, the course here uh, in virtual worlds. But um, um, as, as we taught this initially, um, there was a lot of animosity between these, these groups that the information science students thought the art students were all crazy and just making off the wall comments and easily distracted and, and wearing weird clothes and smelling funny and all, all kinds of things. But and and work the other way around as well. The the art students felt the information science students were nine to fivers and, and you know when it got late into the evening they were all wanting to go home instead of you know when the productive times were just beginning. Um, by the end of the class, in these kind of forced, mixed groups, um, they all developed a real appreciation for each other. 
um, out of necessity because they couldn't have done it without the, the mix of skills. But um, uh, my my lesson was I think that they could have been they could have bypassed a lot of the hard feelings by having been given a heads up as far as the differences in the cultures and um, what to expect and, and uh, some insights into into how to work more productively with uh, people from different populations and different skill sets and culture, um, cultural values. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, in general, it's super difficult as a gamer and a game developer to make educational games while collaborating with teachers because you know they want all the education i want all the fun <laughs> but and, and we, we can never really come to a good balance and you know the, the game suddenly becomes a boring question and answer game or there's no learning at all so i think coming to a good balance is what's required and i hope you know when teachers collaborate with designers that they keep that in mind yeah, so my name is Evan Myers. I work at Syncourse Games. We do a lot of uh, games for corporate training uh, and adult learning. Um, and uh, so sort of the, the, the cross-discipline thing that, that we run into a lot is we're game developers, we're experts in making games for learning. Um, and we work with people who are content experts or sort of corporate learning people. Um, I don't know if there's any parallels to, to K-12 education, but um, one of the uh, sort of fundamental things that I run into a lot with people who haven't done this kind of uh, work is sort of a fundamental misunderstanding of the, the where where the learning happens in games. So a lot of our early games were in safety, so industrial safety, um, learning how to not, uh, not kill people with forklifts, things like that. And when you work with safety people, um, they are so entrenched in a mindset of uh, safety comes first, and we won't even acknowledge the fact that you would never even think about doing it wrong. And so when we introduced games where you could make choices and make the wrong decision, there was a huge discomfort with that. And we've actually seen that mirrored across other disciplines as well, so it's not just a safety thing, but I think it's really pronounced there. Um, and so just as far as the war stories go, I think that's, that's one of those ones where, where it's just been a, a learning experience over the last 10 years, figuring out how to help get people over that hump, like, no, you will actually let your learners you know, drive this workload off the edge of the dock. And you have to be okay with that because you're going to provide consequences and, and help them understand that, that you know, that's a failure that you can now learn from it. You're correct. The other thing, sort of relating back to the story about failure is, um, or this question about failure is, is um, we have a lot of clients who ask that failure be representative, sort of the opposite of the original question, failure be representative of not learning. And in fact, what we found is that a lot of people will succeed and then go back and fail on purpose, uh, you know, because driving a forklift off the other dock is fun. <laughs> and, and, you know, and we, we maintain that that's, that's obviously good learning too. So, so eventually, that's, that's the process that's gotten easier, easier and easier over time as people become more and more literate in games. Um, but it's, I, I'm actually surprised at how often that comes up. Uh, so the two, I think there's two things that I found in leading cross-disciplinary teams that are really important to establish at the beginning. Uh, one is that everyone at the table has something that's super valuable to offer and that everyone needs to respect that. So like, especially like your team of two people, if, if at the beginning they, you know, have, have an agreement that they're both going to value each other's perspectives, that seems to help people play that out better in the long run. And then the other is shared, like establishing shared goals together at the beginning, because being able to point back to that together and say, well, you know, does this thing do what we said we were going to do makes it less about a cross-disciplinary, like, headbutting and more about this thing that we said we were going to do. Yes. That. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that kind of gets to, I think this was your, the next one, we only have a few minutes left, but this was the next one, exposure of the game maker's bias. There's a little bit, I sort of sense in this conversation, a little bit of inherent bias potentially from like coming from one direction or coming from another direction of how you see, how you might see failure, um, for example. Was that what you were thinking about? Well, yeah, because it's almost like it's um, one's values. Like coming from depression parents, like failure was really not an option. And when we're 
raising children with allowing a lot of failure, just like the are there consequences to giving trophies all the time? So the kids now don't put effort in, and so that you know there could be the consequence of children not having any grit, or when they become employees, you have to times that they compliment them and never criticize them because they're not used to it. So uh, you know what? It, it's great to be born in good times, but the consequence of some of this was that was sort of more related to that first one. Okay, one before. I think we don't really have uh, time to get through the other two, although um, design component for education global, that did seem to be a lot of people excited. So I hope after they leave the room, you guys all had a chance. I think most of those people spoke. Please, uh, please continue the conversations with each other and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.